Hi everybody, Andy here. Just before we start this week's show, I have a little announcement to make. We're in Plug Corner, because I have written a book. I have offended again against all the people who say don't, don't do another one, just stop at two, and I've written a third one. And this one, for the first time ever, I've written something that is fun and funny, as well as being gripping. It's called A Beginner's Guide to Breaking and Entering. It's about a young man called Al who lives in gorgeous, empty second homes while the real owners are away. He's got a whole set of rules to help him get into these beautiful houses he could never afford to live in. He has a great life until about chapter three when he and his friends break into the wrong house on the wrong day, somebody ends up dead, and everything goes wrong from there. It's funny, it's gripping, it's pacey. There's a little bit of a message about housing in there. It's a perfect summer read. People have been really nice about it. Val McDermott, Lisa Jewell, some of the queens of crime have been incredibly kind about it. It's out on the 25th of April, so if you order it now, you will be among the first cohort globally to receive your gorgeous copy, and they're really nice looking copies. Please do pre-order it. It can really be the difference between a book flying and not flying if it has a few pre-orders under its belt before that crucial first week. It's out in all good bookshops. It's out in all bad bookshops. It's in most bookshops in the Commonwealth, basically. All you need to do is go in and say, I would like a copy of A Beginner's Guide to Breaking and Entering by Andrew Hunter Murray. Uh, Waterstones even have signed copies if you'd like to get a hold of one of those. I promise it's good. I've put a lot into it. I'm going to stop banging on about it now. It's called A Beginner's Guide to Breaking and Entering. Thanks very much for listening to this. On with the podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Hoban. My name is Alex Bell and I'm joined by Anna Chizinski, Andrew Hunter-Murray and James Harkin. And once again, we are gathered around the microphone to share our four favourite facts from the last seven days. So in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one, and that is Andy. My fact is that half the nitrogen in your body was made in a factory. Wow. Which factory? Ooh, um, well, it won't have been made in the UK anymore. Because of oh. Brexit. Ooh, well, it's a range of factors. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the last nitrogen-making factory, I think, has just uh, shut down. Oh, um, has it? Yeah. Is that the Billingham Manufactory plant? Yes, How it interesting. is. interesting. Has that closed? I didn't know that. It either has done or is about to. But let's zoom out a little bit. Just thinking, though. Yeah. No, let's Even, talk about Billingham. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it's just closed, mm. surely it takes a while for all the nitrogen to be replaced. So maybe some of it's British right. nitrogen you in might, my body. You might have some British nitrogen in you, but I'm afraid a lot of it would be filthy foreign nitrogen. <laughs> um, so, right. Everything, all life forms, don't write in, some, most life forms, <laughs> mammals and plants all contain nitrogen. It's a really important component in your body. Uh, it's required to make the protein in your body and all these various hormones, neurotransmitters. Like, it's vital. You know, nitrogen is very important. And uh, most of the air is nitrogen, right? Mm -hmm. 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen. But that's not where you get your nitrogen from. So you can't just breathe in the nitrogen from the air and get it in your body. No, you can, even if you hold your breath for ages, none of the nitrogen goes in that way. It doesn't work. What a waste. What a waste. But you get it from your food. So meat, fish, dairy, vegetable, cereals, nuts, all of those foods contain some nitrogen, right? Yeah. So plants get it from the air. I mean, there's a complicated bacterial process. By I'm which sure we'll get there. Nitrogen <laughs> ends up in or lightning. Or lightning, and that's another way. <laughs> we'll get there as well. Yeah. <laughs> the point is that about two or three kilos of your body, roughly half of your forearm to the end of your hand, is nitrogen. Is that where it all is? Uh, and that's where it all is. Um, so the amount of you made in a factory is roughly your hand and wrist. And that's because nitrogen-based fertilizer has become an enormous thing in the last century. It's incredibly important. It's why the human population has risen from one or two billion to now eight billion. Mm. The sole reason is that we have enough ways of feeding people because we have enough fertilizers to grow crops. Right. And the way we do that is with this brilliant chemical process discovered at the start of the 20th century, which allows us to pull nitrogen from the sky mm -hmm. and make it into fertilizer to Amazing. make plants grow. Does this oh, mean I'm not organic? Yeah. 
Shit. <laughs> well, yeah. What's the point of buying all that nice food? <laughs> <laughs> Nitrogen fixation. Do you remember learning about that? Mm. That was where I sort of lost interest. And now coming back to it, I thought, God, this is fascinating. But <laughs> poor old nitrogen being told it has to be fixed. Mm. So there's of this conundrum, which Andy sort of touched on, where it's, it's the air's full of it, but plants can't take it in without assistance. And so it needs to be fixed by these bacteria that basically make plant roots grow these nodules, which act as their home and then they live in these nodules and they fix this nitrogen, turning it into ammonia, which plants can use. And the nitrogen came originally from a star exploding. Ooh. That's essentially it. Didn't know that. The Big Bang can make hydrogen and helium, but anything else needs to be made in stars. The original nitrogen factory is a star. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So some star created lots of nitrogen, then it exploded, eventually it came to Earth. Then eventually it got in the sky. <laughs> then eventually a bacterium <laughs> fixed it. And then it got put into a carrot. And then you ate the carrot. And then it went into your bloodstream. And then it got turned into proteins, which got turned into muscles. It definitely gets less exciting, doesn't it? <laughs> you, 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 like, part of the journey starts off really well. And then it's sort of sitting in a carrot. Yeah. So how did we learn to make this stuff? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Oh, it's like Inside the Factory with Greg Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Like, oh, look at that nitrogen. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> lovely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. It's all thanks to something called the Haber Bosch process, or Haber Bosch, sometimes known. So Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch were two German chemists. And um, the problem was, like, everyone knew that we needed more nitrogen at the time, but it was very hard to work out how we're going to actually get it. And you, we talked about guano, like the guano gold rush, because bird poo contains lots of nitrates. Mm. So that, in the 19th century, was used to increase crop yields, mm. and that saved everyone's bacon, and, you know, it was brilliant for a while. <laughs> everyone ran out of... Yeah, they put it on their bacon. Bacon, very <laughs> nice. Um, <laughs> we're talking about the Haber Bosch process. Um, <laughs> Can I talk about bacon for a second? <laughs> yeah, go on, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, bacon is... Most bacon is cured with nitrates. Right. As in, that's what makes it last longer which is a type of nitrogen or it's a, you know it's a molecule oh, with nitrogen in it okay. and when it goes green bacon that is something called nitrate burn and it's a reaction to the chemical that's used to cure it and it means that it's still good to eat so if your bacon's got a bit green you can still eat it amazing it's, it's mm. not bacteria it's not anything that's bad for you it's just a natural part of the process i thought it was rotten yeah i thought mm. my bacon mm. had gone off i'm not oh, saying no. that all green bacon is good to eat <laughs> no, that's what i've taken away from <laughs> but this but if you no. <laughs> bought it only a week ago it's probably fine mm. sorry andy you were saying about bosch and harbour harbour yeah so basically he was a chemist and it was a very it's a very difficult process to work out. Um, he knew that lightning, as you said, James, breaks apart nitrogen bonds because nitrogen molecules are really tightly bonded. It takes a lot of effort to break them apart, to turn them into ammonia. But eventually he worked out a sort of pressurised process to combine nitrogen and hydrogen, and that makes the ammonia oh, okay. fertiliser. Mm -hmm. And he developed that in 1913, Harbour, and it was just before the war. And there's a theory that it actually kept the First World War going for longer than it should have done because German imports of fertiliser were blockaded, but he was able to, he had created a process where you could make, as they called it, bread from air. So yeah. if we stopped any poo from getting over to Germany during the war, they could make their own stuff. Exactly. Not food, but... yeah. Yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah. I mean, oh, that was it. Um, and he got the Nobel Prize for it, didn't he? Which yeah. was extremely controversial. It was very on controversial. On account of his other, other legacy. <laughs> yeah, because he made poison gas. Right. Yeah. That's so far. I can't believe the Nobel Prize in 1919 went to someone who'd invented, which gas was it? Was it? Chlorine. Chlorine gas. It's it was, bad. It was yeah. quite controversial. <laughs> yeah. He did kill 90,000 people with it. Not, he didn't go around personally spraying it into the trenches. Yeah, but, but he but... was responsible for the birth of arguably six billion. Yep, so it absolutely. swings and roundabouts. He, do you think on like, interviews and stuff, he's like, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about my <laughs> Nobel Prize winning work. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah, his wife, Clara, was a chemist as well. Mm. And they had a huge dispute after the, I think, the first Battle of Ypres. Yeah. where poison gas was used for the first time and killed thousands. He said it was no different to killing someone with a bomb or a bullet. She said it is very different. And then she she killed herself. She oh shot herself. The, the ultimate act uh, in an argument. We don't know for <laughs> sure that the argument is what led to the suicide because oh, really? she didn't leave any notes or anything like no. that. But, but we okay. know she really... She's fascinating, Clara Haber, and, or Haber, if you're a German listening. She was Germany's first female doctor of chemistry. Uh, she got a PhD in 1900. 
and she turned him down the first time Fritz proposed she turned him down because she wanted to be financially independent which is crazy in 1900 yeah. as a woman but she'd gone hey I want to live under my own steam and then she decided marriage would kind of empower her mm. which it bloody well didn't which she did complain about understandably she was like hang on my <laughs> husband turns out to be very self-serving constantly working I don't have a chance at all to develop my career Yeah. Um, and he's a mass murderer and it turns out he's a mass murderer and that's the final straw and he was like no no talk about that other stuff talk about the Nobel Prize <laughs> Stuff. Did you see pictures of her? I think she looks a bit like Fenella, Dan's wife. Oh, do you? Yeah, I haven't seen a photo of her. I'm not very good with faces, as we all know. Right, <laughs> but that was what I thought. And do you associate Dan with um, Fritz Haber, the mass murdering but mass life producing complex character? In some ways, but I think Dan is more of a wife guy than Fritz Haber. Was. <laughs> <laughs> so then Haber um, escaped to Switzerland wearing a false beard. Amazing. After the war, what? amazing. Uh, and then after World War One, because obviously we had then had the Treaty of Versailles, which really punished Germany, mm. right? And so he came up with the idea of extracting gold from the ocean to pay off all of the war reparations, because he knew that there was loads and loads of gold in the ocean, mm. and he thought, if I can get at that, we'll be rich beyond our wildest dreams. It doesn't work, and actually, we still can't do it, of course. What's where, that where, term that I think you've told me about, James, for when Nobel Prize winners win a prize and then they come up with a really insane yeah. subsequent yeah. It goes idea. to their head, yeah. Nobelitis. <laughs> Nobelitis sounds like a serious case of seriously yeah, sore yeah. Nobelitis. But if you'd done it once, but you'd literally made bread from air. Yeah. The yeah, human right. population is going to grow by billions. Thanks That's to true. From so the guy know. who brought bread from air comes gold from the yeah, ocean. Exactly. It works. Yeah, I believe it. That works. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And actually, sort of associated, the Nobel Prize in 1935 was awarded for basically being able to turn an element into another element which was the alchemy that people had dreamed of forever and ever. That True. People had tried to make gold, and actually this was turning boron into nitrogen, which wasn't quite the fantasy <laughs> of a 17th century alchemist. Yeah. But like the, um, these factories were taking already existing nitrogen out of the air and mm. making it into ammonia, which could be used. But Marie Curie's daughter, who won that prize, right? Yeah. I can't remember her name, but that was actually making new nitrogen, which no one had ever done before, apart totally. from stars. Oh, yeah. So this was amazing. And I didn't realise that the um, she was the second female to win a Nobel Prize, Marie Curie's daughter. Um, and it was, was it Marie Curie the first? Yeah. Yes. The and it was Nepo husband. baby. <laughs> <laughs> but it was husband and wife as well. So just like Marie Curie and her husband Pierre, who won a joint prize, sweetly, it was Marie Curie's daughter Irene and her husband Frederick Joliot Curie, who won wow. the Nobel Prize in 1935. Do you think that maybe they didn't have a chance unless you sort of did stand behind a man a bit? And then. I'm sure there was something of that. Yeah. Although her surname was Curie, so I think that probably yeah. helped. I think that yeah. opened yeah. a few doors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also her way of making nitrogen was firing radioactivity at boron wasn't it i think yeah um so it's kind of you know in the parents realm okay yeah she probably had all the equipment in the garage already it, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's a lot easier when you and if memory serves i think she died of leukemia didn't she uh, what the irene, younger i think irene did related yeah. to the work she'd done i'm sure oh. didn't know I, that. to be honest i'm going off memory but i think oh. that's right because Mary, it was the last thing that Mary almost did was see the results of her daughter's successful wow. test before she died of leukemia. Oh. Yeah, nice. One thing on the Billingham manufacturing plant. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> thank God. In Stockton on Tees in England. We better get a free trip <laughs> out of this. It's closed. I'm not going to a closed down night. I've had factory. worse day trips out on the QI credit card. <laughs> yeah. um, Aldous Huxley went there. They gave him a trip around. And he based some of Brave New World on it. So, you know, in Brave New World, they, like, have a factory making humans, I think, don't they? Yeah. Oh. And, um, like, yeah, they make clones and stuff like that. Yeah. And he saw this Billingham factory that was effectively making life by making this Ooh. nitrogen. I am imagining, thought, oh. like, Willy Wonka style. Like, it's so whimsical. And they've got... It's a reverse Willy Wonka, because in Willy Wonka, don't the kids go in and never come out? Whereas in Brave New World, you get loads of new kids True. from the factory. The, the, the kids do come out. They just come do out they? in all weird shapes and colours. And like, they've all been really quite fucked up psychologically and physically. Yeah. Every know. chocolate factory has a nitrogen factory next to it to make new children. Yeah. Fed right. to the chocolate factory. Horrific process. I learned about what I think is the most exciting moment in history. In all of history. Wow. As we said at the start, nitrogen is essential for life because it makes amino acids, uh, which make proteins, and that's like the, the whole building box of what all living things are made of. 
But there's this kind of mystery, which is how did the first life get its nitrogen? Because as we've said, it needs this bacteria to be made accessible. And it can also be made by lightning striking through it, mm -hmm. but actually not enough seems to be generated by that. Um, and it seemed quite unlikely. And it seems like the likeliest explanation for where the very first life ever came from. So God. Whatever, three and a half billion years ago is God. And there we go. <laughs> that is exciting. But hang on, wait, this is, this is like the original chicken and egg, really. What um, is the actual yeah. answer? So what is the answer? Yeah. The answer is it happened with volcanic lightning which I just think Ooh. is the coolest moment. Mm. It's so basically when volcanoes erupt, then lots and lots of lightning can be generated from the eruption. It's when all this ash goes up. It's a really complicated process, but basically the ash rubbing against each other makes static electricity. And if you look, you've got loads and loads of lightning bolts, hundreds of them in this volcanic eruption. And scientists have looked at the soil around volcanoes, seen they're full of nitrates, which plants can yeah. use, and realized we think it, this must be how the first life ever was created, was when shed loads of lightning was firing above a volcano as it was erupting, and it allowed nitrogen to get into the soil oh in a way gosh. that could make that it. That is cool. That, that is isn't like isn't an origin cool? story I can get behind. I'm so glad it wasn't. It wasn't just like, oh, this cell touched this cell, and then a fish <laughs> flopped out of a thing, and like it's, all of the other origin stories are so lame. That's like Frankenstein, yeah, electricity, yeah. Yeah, evil yeah, laughter, lava. Yeah, it's great. So metal. Yeah. yeah. Um, James, you just mentioned the Treaty of Versailles. Yes. So. The Haber Bosch process is so significant that it was part of the package of the Treaty of Versailles. No, was yeah, it? the Western powers that... ordered via the treaty Germany to hand over the secret of <gasps> making these fertilizers. Really? Yeah, wow. like, that makes that sense. Was, wow. There's all sorts of stuff they cobbled on to the they Treaty did. of Versailles. Oh, like, yeah. Crazy yeah. shit. Right? We've, yeah. we've mentioned it in the past, and I can't remember what it was. Something else that's Champagne. really random. Champagne. They also didn't they didn't they want to change the way that orchestras were tuned? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. music. Mm. That's it. Like Ridiculous. there must have been like. Yeah. And another thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like having an argument with your partner. Yeah. And it yeah. starts with something else and you're like, I'm just going to dredge up all these other things. Yeah. <laughs> the ultimate argument with a partner. Yeah. Um, the, oh what's champagne? Sorry. Oh, they, um, the fact that champagne can only be made in the champagne region and anywhere else it's oh. sparkling wine. That comes from the Treaty of Versailles. Does it? Amazing. I didn't know that. Wow. I was thinking, like, surely the French already had champagne. Like, what was the... <laughs> the interesting part of that being that um, Russia didn't sign it and America didn't sign it and in both those countries you can buy champagne which isn't from France. No yeah. way. So they, Although they didn't sign the Treaty of Versailles. No. Really the little known yeah. fact the First World War is still going on. <laughs> <laughs> they had their own treaties. They did. Do yeah. America and Russia have a good culture of champagne? Are they known for their good champagne anywhere? Californian white wine must yeah, that's be true. you must be able to make good champagne yeah. out of that. Yeah, just stick an alka seltzer in it. <laughs> <laughs> Bob's your uncle. <laughs> Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hello, everybody. This week, we are sponsored by HelloFresh. Yes, HelloFresh makes wholesome eating very, very easy indeed. It gives you long-term benefits, not just saving time in the short term, but helping you to think about what you eat and what you cook. That's right. So it's always super nutritious. It's such a useful way to just tick off all your vegetables so you can eat entirely toffee crisps throughout the day because so often it's such a huge vegetable intake you're getting with a HelloFresh meal. It's got really interesting recipes that you wouldn't think to cook yourself. On this week's menu, you could choose between some Greek-inspired oregano pork kofta gyros. Mm. Um, or there's an amazing vegetarian selection as well. So hop to it and go to hellofresh.co.uk slash new fish and use that link to get 60% off your first order and 25% off the next two months. Absolutely. If you fancy some Greek gyros with a toffee crisp dessert, then go to <laughs> hellofresh.co.uk slash new fish and unlock more in your kitchen. If you use that link, you will get 60% off your first order and 25% of the next two months. Okay, on with the podcast. On with the show. <laughs> Okay, it is time for fact number two, and that is Anna. My fact this week is that Harriet Tubman once walked into a hospital and asked a doctor to cut her head open, and he immediately did. <laughs> Just mad. 
Um, so Harriet Tubman, extremely famous in America, probably less well known about here, I would say, but you know, one of the most influential famous abolitionists ever, um, one of the conductors of the Underground Railroad, responsible for smuggling lots of enslaved people into freedom in the 19th century. And one thing that I've learned through reading about her, she was insanely hardcore. Yeah. So, yeah. so tough. <laughs> so, and this is just an element of it. She was very old at the time. She must have been in her 60s or 70s, I think, in the 1890s. And late 1890s, she's in Boston and she passed this big building and she asked what it was and someone said it was a hospital. And she thought, <laughs> well, I've had these terrible headaches my whole life. She really had had awful like headaches and um, like terrible vision problems, was probably disabled by it. So she went right in and she said, I saw a young man there and I said, sir, are you a doctor? And he said he was. And then I said, sir, do you think you could cut my head open? And he said, lay right down here on this table. No. And sans painkillers, he sawed open her <laughs> skull and raised it up, apparently. And then as she put it, she got up, put on her bonnet and started to walk home. But her legs did get a bit wobbly and give out under her. So they gave her an ambulance to take her the rest of the way. <laughs> It's astonishing. Yeah, sorry, some questions. Like, <laughs> when you say he raised up, is it like a loft extension of her skull? <laughs> uh, was, it, was her brain too big? What, what is going on? I think this was a, a slightly um, uh, questionable medical procedure, which she said worked and may have been more placebo than like. Actually. She didn't go and say, my brain is a bit low. I feel like my brain's a little bit low in my head. <laughs> it's always been my neck. Could she just wrench it? Well, she did say it feels more comfortable now. Yeah. But, but apparently yeah, she, fact, yeah, refused anesthetic bit a bullet um, as they did in the Civil War. That is actually, is that I'm afraid, a myth, but it's a very interesting subject you raise, Alex, because oh. it's the mythology of her life, which has been so turned into all these stories. I personally don't believe any of this. It sounds ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because the more you read, you're like, that's a great fact. And then you read again, someone goes, no, that's a myth. Yeah. yeah. And then a lot of the myths come from relatively close sources, don't they? Mm. Like the first biography of her that was written there's loads of myths in there. Well, she never I got think. to write her own. She wanted to write her own. She never got to. So Is it? Then, yeah, she... Well, you need to learn to read first, hon. Yeah, it's true. Well, That's have you heard slam, this story? Because she was illiterate. Yeah, yeah I was, I was <laughs> wondering. Slam, it's interesting. Yeah. 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 That's how yeah. yeah. someone brought Harriet Tubman down. <laughs> yeah. That's, really, that's <laughs> why I decided to do a fact about it. On the reading, did you hear? I'm, I imagine this could be an apocryphal tale as well, but there's a story that she was many years after all of her time running the Underground Railroad that she was on a train um, and a former master of hers got on. Um, and she was a known figure by that point. But And so to avoid being recognised, she grabbed a nearby newspaper and pretended to read it because she was known for not being able to read. Uh, oh, yeah. And then oh. who was on the front cover of that newspaper? <laughs> yeah, yeah, was, yeah. The face was lined up perfectly <laughs> without the wanted sign. Yeah. No, I... I think it's I probably think untrue. That, that might be... Because I've yeah. heard a different version of it, which is that when she was on one of her missions, because she left the yeah. South where she'd been enslaved and she went back to free former slaves and, you know, she did a lot of that shuttling back and forward. But she was back in the South in 1856 and she overheard some men reading her wanted poster, right? Which said clearly... <laughs> She's illiterate. And then she got out a book and pretended to read it. And the ploy was enough to fool the men. And they're like, she looks just like Harriet Tubman, but she's yeah. reading, so it can't be her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's reading a normal book upside down. Like, so it can't be her. But why would you put on the wanted poster that the She the can't read. It doesn't illiterate. make any sense. It's, it's yeah, exactly. one of the least yeah, relevant yeah. things. No, totally. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And also, I think the idea that people even knew who she was at the time is right. false. So they knew mm. that there was a person who was helping all these enslaved <laughs> people be freed. They knew that people were calling them some kind of Moses because they were freeing their people, but they didn't know anything about her personally. And a lot of people assumed it was a white abolitionist who oh. was helping yeah. enslaved people. But it so, is, is interesting because I, I, I a lot of the stuff you read, you just think that can't be true. And it's not to do down her amazing achievements at all, but it's to show that she's... She's become this like unbelievable cult figure. It's almost myth mythological with some of the stories yeah. around her. We've got to tread quite a careful line between yeah. slamming yeah. one of the <laughs> most sort of beloved and famous women in American history and also sort of acknowledging yeah. like, she, she, did, was she did amazing stuff. Yeah, I yeah. find her the most incredible person, one of the most incredible people ever. I don't, I don't have the energy sometimes to finish the research with this podcast. And <laughs> this mm. woman who was like, she was very disabled. She was female. She was black. She was enslaved. Just this extraordinary life. And she fought in the Civil War as well. She, After being this abolitionist hero, she fought in the Civil War. She was incredibly charitable. I don't understand where she got the energy. And it actually makes me quite angry. <laughs> her injury, um, her disability came when she was um, injured by an overseer who threw a stone weight at her head 
when she was quite young. Mm. He actually uh, threw it at someone else, I think, and it missed and it hit her. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, that's bad luck. But yeah, she had sleeping spells uh, quite often, so she would just kind of fall asleep. What we'd probably call narcolepsy today. Um, but she would have like these kind of hazy dreams while she was asleep. And because she was very religious, she thought they were kind of premonitions from God. Mm. It's quite stressful, the idea. Let's say you've been enslaved. Harriet Tubman's come back. She's freed you. Yeah. She's guiding you to the north. And then she just falls asleep. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit of a comedy scene. There, there, there is sitcom potential in this life, is all I'm saying. No, but that's... I think that might be the first time ever someone said there's sitcom potential in Harriet Tubman's life. <laughs> Maybe. If she went back, she freed... Uh, the numbers vary. So she rescued 60 or 70 people herself, personally, and then she gave instructions to another 70-odd. Mm. And that got slightly inflated to 300. But she did go back. I mean, yeah. between about around 10 times times she made a mission back into the south which was really perilous she also know. went back at one point to go free her husband who she'd left yeah. came back found that he'd remarried and there's a line which again is probably just a biographer right but it's sort of like she thought about making a scene but then decided against it and rescued him anyway but it's like <laughs> the idea again of like the sort of two minutes where she's deciding whether to massively kick off that you find another woman or to save well you. he didn't yeah. need to be rescued per se because he was not enslaved he was a free man right um, was but he? yeah yeah um, which was kind of a big deal at the time because a free man marrying an enslaved woman, mm. you would lose a lot of your rights yeah. um, because all your children would be oh. automatically enslaved. You wouldn't be able to get married unless you had permission of the of the woman's master, as they called them. Um, yeah, so that was quite a big deal. But yeah, like you say, once she was off doing her gallivanting, yeah. he was like, no, I'm just going to find another he wife remarried. now. Remarried. Yeah. Again, the sitcom is taking shape. You know? <laughs> I, one one sweet thing I do like is that when she retired, eventually, she retired into a retirement home that she had founded. So she, in 1908, she opened the Harriet Tubman Home for the Elderly, specifically for, like, indigent and aged African-Americans, as, yeah. as it was described. And Are we then, sure they didn't misunderstand? And she said, no, I called it the Harriet Tubman Home because it's just a home just for, for me. Harriet. Yeah. <laughs> Here's another good thing. Okay, this is uh, good. And I th I'm pretty sure this is true as well. So on the missions, when she was taking people over to the North, she would sing, right? And there were particular songs. And uh, some people say she would sing um, things like Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, but that hadn't been written yet. So, But she was very ahead of her she, time. She so. was, yeah. <laughs> there were, was she in England? Rugby <laughs> time. She was, yeah. Um, so there were songs called Go Down Moses and Bound for the Promised Land, right? And those were real songs, which she did sing at the time. Yeah. And this is a cool thing. She would change the tempo of the songs to indicate whether it was safe to come out or not. So she would just be walking along singing. But the way she was singing was a message to the people she was ferrying north. Yeah. Really? Do you think it's cool? Does that mean like, you know, if everything's going well and they need to run, did she like go diddle in, diddle in, diddle in, diddle in? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you then if up. they needed to be slower, she would just do yeah. it. Yeah. And if huh. she stops singing completely, she's she fallen asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking into possibly what kind of brain surgery she had. And then I went on a bit of a journey and found a really fascinating syndrome, which I cannot believe we have never spoken about before and i feel like you we all might have it actually um it, this is the it's <laughs> called forster syndrome or also known as witzel soot and it's the pathological urge to constantly make puns <laughs> Witzel sucks. I yeah. had that for a while. Witzel sucked. <laughs> oh. Somebody get a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. Um, so this was first noted in 1929 by a German neurologist called Ottfried Forster, which is what his name, who is named after. He was operating on a patient to remove a tumour, and the patient was awake, as often happens, as was the case with Harriet Tubman, and. As he started moving around this tumour, the man suddenly, he was face down, strapped to the table. He suddenly just started talking manically and just like <laughs> making pun after pun. They were all Shoot, basically... Man. I hardly even met him. Literally that. It was literally all about knives and surgery. And he'd obviously, because that was what was on his mind because he was having brain right, surgery. Right, right. Um, and literally what was on his mind. <laughs> literally, <laughs> exactly. Jesus, guys, can you stop? Like, <laughs> like, it's it, it, absolutely fascinating. And then there've been more recent examples of this. There was a, a man um, a few years ago. He, we just know his name is Derek because he was anonymous, but mm -hmm. he had a couple of strokes and his behavior changed in many ways. He used to try and compulsively recycle stuff and things like that. And he started waking up his wife in the middle of the night being like, I've just come up with another pun. And eventually his wife was like, why didn't you start <laughs> writing them down and not telling me? Um, but eventually realized that this was like a pathological behavior change. Wow. And the interesting <laughs> other side effect is this, is that you, it's a really simple, basic humor, like basic pun connections, basic, really basic well, jokes. I, 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 I think there's a lot of skill involved. Yeah. Like, neurologist 
scientists studied this and they showed them more <laughs> complex joke patterns. They didn't find them funny at all. And it's something to do with that really basic pleasure of making a connection in your head. But they also didn't find other people's jokes funny at all. <laughs> That's basically every comedian, isn't it? <laughs> um, another thing about Tubman is that she did get fame by the end of her life and was recognisable. And a bunch of receptions were put on in her honour in the 1890s. They were put on in Boston and she didn't live there. She had to get a train. But to pay for the train ticket, she had to sell one for cows. So in order to get to a bunch huh. of receptions thrown in her honour, wow. where she was the star guest, she Gosh. sold her cow to get the train. I think yeah. she was. She spent so much of her life in different parts of her life in poverty just because she just gave away so much stuff. And when she rescued people from slavery, she used to then follow through and like get them jobs and like set them up in their new places. They did. She didn't just like get them somewhere and be like, see ya. Yeah. Like, she did a lot of cooking too. And that was relevant because she raised a lot of money for the missions by cooking, basically. Oh. And there was a really interesting piece about this sort of facet of her life on NPR. So she was once at a market. She came face to face with a former sort of slave overseer, basically. And she was holding two chickens, right? Oh, yeah. Now, what did she do? She pretended to read the chickens. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she said, oh, looks like there's three cocks in the room. <laughs> Very sassy. We're going in the pilot script. Uh, Did she shove her head into a chicken and to disguise herself as a chicken? She, hit him with a chicken. She threw eggs at him. She released one of the chickens and then pretended to chase it, causing a comic kerfuffle. Oh. Ironically, by drawing attention to herself, she deflected attention from herself. Again, another scene in the sitcom. Is that, that's what happens in Mr. Bean's Holiday. He chases a chicken for like 40 minutes. It's <laughs> <laughs> comedy gold. That's yeah. so clever. We've got the beanographer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do love Mr Bean um, So there's a link between her and Queen Victoria Which I find interesting yes. So in 1897 Queen Victoria sent her a shawl To sort of mark her amazing work Yeah, yeah it was a gift <laughs> Yeah a gift yeah yeah But I thought I'd do a little quiz for you now Brilliant Who, <laughs> who was taller Queen Victoria or Harriet Tubman Ooh, good oh, Well one. Queen Victoria was no more than five foot, I think perhaps less, four foot eleven. She was famously quite short. Famously yeah. short. I believe yeah. famously her circumference ended up being more than her height at the end yeah. of her life. Does so. this help us with, with Tubman though? So I've, Tubman's got to be taller. I know she was on the small side. I think she's going to be smaller because it's not a fun quiz because Queen Victoria was quite short. She's I probably think shorter than most I think, people. I think the fun ship has sailed. <laughs> <on this quiz. laughs> I'm going to say, uh, I think Tubman was an inch taller. Okay. I reckon she was five foot on the dot. Okay. I'm going to say they're exactly the same height. Brilliant. I'm going to say Tubman was an inch shorter. Um, well, Anna's closest. <laughs> Tubman was four foot eleven. Oh. Queen Victoria. Now, James, I have read. I, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I went down a real rabbit hole. I'm sure you're right. Basically, we know there's a surviving tape measure kept by a portraitist <laughs> in 1837. <laughs> oh my God. Which shows she was five foot one because she had been Victoria. I mean, now not Tubman. But Queen Victoria had been claimed to be five foot two, and they they boosted her height by an inch. Obviously, it would be ridiculous to say she's five foot ten and, you know, really leggy. Yeah. Maybe but, she was wearing heels. <laughs> yeah. Basically, they were a bit embarrassed, the royal family, that she was only five foot one because yeah. it made it seem like she hadn't been fed well in childhood and, you yeah. know, she did, like taller children tend to be better fed. They boosted her height, sort of her public height, to five foot two oh, so that she would seem a bit better. But what? the portrait artist had the, the receipts. What I think is interesting is that this means approximately that Queen Victoria is about the same height as Sandy Toxvig and Harriet Tubman was about the same height as Susan Kalman. Yeah. So if we need people in your sitcom mm -hmm. of Tubman... <laughs> I think that's some problematic casting there, if you're saying yeah. Susan Kalman for the role of Harriet Tubman. I, I do see that now, yeah. yeah. <laughs> OK, time now for fact number three, and that is James. OK, my fact this week is that wasabi is good on sushi rolls and papyrus scrolls. Hmm. Lovely. I, I yeah. beg to differ, personally. What? Never tasted papyrus, and yet I reckon I know it's not good. Ah. With or without wasabi. Well, we come to the fact itself. <laughs> oh, he's worded it humorously. <laughs> it's, I wouldn't say that's even humorous. You've, it's just a rhyme. <laughs> like... Yeah. Lyrically. Right. You've, Lyric, you've yeah. worded it misleadingly in the hope of humour. <laughs> no. It charmed me. I found it amusing. It is not misleading at all. Um, so it's good on sushi rolls because it tastes good, in my opinion. And mm -hmm. there are other reasons that we might come to. Papyrus scrolls, though, is the main interesting part, which is this new technique of looking after papyrus. Now, there is a problem 
that because papyrus is made from plants, it can fall victim to fungal infections uh, and the fungus can damage the papyrus and it can cause the paints to fade and stuff like that. And so there has been a study in the Journal of Archaeological Science which has put some wasabi vapors onto the uh, papyrus and these smells kill off the funguses or rather stop the funguses from growing very well and they don't get rid of the color so you can still read them and yeah this is a lot safer and better for the environment than what you might use before which is chemicals it's oh, super non so cool. super non-invasive because they just put the wasabi near the papyrus yeah and, yeah and... what i really like in this study is that they didn't want to use actual, you know, ancient Egyptian papyruses, but they wanted to see if it worked on something like that. So they did exactly what you would do at primary school, which is heated up some papyrus to make it look like it was really old. <laughs> you know, like you might do if you were making a pirate map at yeah. school. Yeah. Well, did they, they dip it in some... tea? They didn't dip it in tea. <laughs> so they, no. took some... they made new papyrus. They yeah. made new papyrus. Aged and it up fast. They aged yeah. it fast by heating it up. That's so clever. Yeah. yeah. And then they mix water and wasabi, almost like if you mix your wasabi with soy sauce, that kind of, you know. Mm. And after stuff, the end slush. of the process, you've got a snack. Yeah, exactly. I'm less worried about wasting papyri on this process and more worried about wasting good wasabi on this process. Oh, are it's, you? A, it's very precious wasabi. It's very hard to um, make, isn't it? It's hard mm, to yeah. obtain it. And they're just like steaming away wasabi at papyri. Yeah, and isn't most be... wasabi not real wasabi? I mean, I've probably never had real wasabi. I don't think I've ever had real no. wasabi. It's no. mostly You've been to Japan, though. You must have done. I have been, but I read that even in Japan, yeah. a lot oh, of it is. is... It? I believe I'm most sorry, of like, it in Japan. Yeah. It's Look, horseradish. It's like, what if I went wow. to a really nice restaurant in Japan? You're probably fine. Would yeah. it be? Hard I think to... five or ten percent of wasabi served in Japan is real wasabi. Really? And the, but in the West, it's like one percent is real wasabi. Yeah, it's yeah. really and it's all horseradish. It's all it's dyed all horseradish. horseradish. Yeah. And horseradish is really strong. But I think wasabi is a bit gentler and a bit more interestingly delicate and a bit more flavoursome. So yeah, that's okay. what I read. Yeah. 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 And a bit gr you can tell if you've got real stuff because it's a bit should be a bit grittier. Also, I didn't realise that you need to eat it immediately. As soon as it's been grated, because it loses its mm. zing. So essentially, you the, the, sometimes they bring a root to the table and a grater, and you grate it uh, fresh onto your food. It it's sounds. Quite to me, I think I prefer the horseradish. If real wasabi is bland and gritty, and you have to have it immediately <laughs> fresh, or it goes off even more. No one said bland. I just want to say, if there are any chefs out there, oh, Alex said bland. We didn't say bland. <laughs> I believe Del delicate. delicate. <laughs> um, and the other thing, the other reason wasabi is good on sushi rolls, so not just because it tastes good but also because it has antimicrobial properties. So as well as stopping funguses from growing, it can stop bacteria from growing. And it has something in there called 6-methylsulfinylhexyl isothiocyanate, uh, which stops E. coli, staphylococcus, and salmonella from growing. Really? Yeah. It sounds like we should be taking baths in it or something. It would be good for us as an anti... I think... Even the delicate wasabi, if you have a bath in it, <laughs> is going to get right up your nose. Yeah, fair, fair, fair. Mm, and yeah. will cost you a fair few bob. But you I could reckon. put it. You could put a bit in your shoes and stop a fungal infection. Or you something. could go for a bath, an onsen in Japan, and maybe someone could come over and just grate a little bit of wasabi. Yeah, into that your would be bath. so Lovely. nice. Yeah, that's that's luxurious. You can lick it. Sorry. You can lick it, and you won't taste the spice. Um, oh. So. Oh, so there's no point in licking it. Uh, no, unless you don't like spicy food, but you want to eat wasabi, in which case just lick it and then you won't get the spice, but you'll have touched wasabi with your tongue. If you have fungus or microbes on your tongue. Yes. Yes. That's a good point. Maybe. I think that should work. In fact, and it's a lot like how lightning can split up nitrate. Um, so by grating wasabi, think of the grater as the lightning, that splits up <laughs> the wasabi plant and it splits up its cells. What a tortured metaphor. How labored, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I could have understood it without yeah. any of the previous callback. Are you sure? Is that what creates the flavor? Do you so it breaks up the cells and creates the flavor. So exactly. Anna, how does wasabi work? Well, <laughs> let me take you back to the dawn of the universe. <laughs> Did you know horseradish is poisonous to horses? No. Really? no. Ouch. So they don't know why it's called that, but I actually like both options. So the word horseradish first appeared in 1597 in English. People think it might be because it resembles a horse's genitalia. Crumbs. <laughs> it speaks of a time when more people were familiar with what horses' knackers look like. True. You know, exactly. I could probably draw you one, but I would... Probably could draw them in push if I had to. You know, absolutely no, you could do an amazing shaded sketch. <laughs> so it's either genitals 
horseradish. Um, yes, because they do look a bit like the yeah. horseradish is like like a mooly. I mean, that's probably less. What's, what's a mooly? It's what? like a long white radish, right? Oh, that's what that. it looks like. Okay. It's is like that a what long a white is? root. Yeah. Are they really big? Yeah, it's probably. I would say, how big is that? About foot long. That nah, looks pretty normal. I think your mooly simile might have been up there with my confusing lightning simile <laughs> <Yeah>. for <laughs> what, making what, things clearer. What, what's a mooly? A mooly is like a large radish. Like a horseradish. Yeah, that's right. right. They're similar. I understand. I can but see I, us going round in circles. I on this genuinely one. thought people would know what a mooly looked like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Um. What's the other option, Anna? Well remembered. Thanks, James. Um. <laughs> it's because so in German you might so you might be able to guess if I tell you that in German a horseradish is called Meerrettich to mean sea radish, actually. Oh. Not to be confused with the sea radish, which is a different plant. I know, because it looks like a seahorse's genitalia. Yeah, you're, very nice. You're miles off. Well, uh, in the older <laughs> days, everyone knew what that looked like. Because <laughs> we all rode seahorses around town, didn't we? What Georgia. grows in the sea and looks like a radish? It's more about Sponge the pronunciation. Sponge square pattern. <laughs> <laughs> It's about the pronunciation. So yeah. when we were yeah. translating it into English, we heard mare radish. Oh, mare, as in like mare the mare, radish. as in a female oh. horse. As mare. in a horse. Yeah. But... Let me give you another reason why it might be called that. Albertus Magnus was writing in the 13th century and he discussed horseradish. He just called it radish, but he suggested it as a treatment for constipation in horses. Oh. So it could be that we kind of heard the mare, thought we use it for constipation in horses anyway. And so maybe that's why we call it horseradish. And is it, is it up the bottom? It didn't say. Albertus Magnus didn't say. He just said it's used for constipation in horses. It might have been up the bum because there's another thing called raphanidosis, uh, which is a punishment in ancient Greece of inserting the root of a radish up the bum as a punishment for adultery. Mm. Now, we don't know what kind of radish that was. It probably wasn't one of those little red ones that you get in Sainsbury's. Because... <laughs> That's the first offence. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but if it was horseradish, for instance, yeah. then that would be much more of a punishment because you're going to get that kind of wasabi burning Ooh. up the bum as well as having something that's the size of a moolie going up your bum. Not but the size what? of a moolie. <laughs> <laughs> I bet there was one person who got really turned on by it. <laughs> Do you think? I bet there was one example where someone was like, oh no, I with... adulterated again. <laughs> Get the hammer. With, familiar with the stories of ancient Greece, Alex. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's the thing on um, papyrus. Mm. Right. Oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> Have you... Right. You know the Library of Alexandria? Yeah. Yes. Mm. Okay. Ancient Egypt, founded in the 295 BC. Yeah. They had a copy of every book, or they were trying to get one. So the, to the Ptolemies, with the pharaohs at the time, the, yeah. they're all called Ptolemy, basically. And yeah. they would hunt for manuscripts everywhere, right? And they would send out... If a foreign ship sailed into Alexandria, it was searched for scrolls, and then they'd be confiscated and copied out and then given back. And the, all, all, the, all of this was on papyrus, right? Uh -huh. And the Nile Valley was the centre of the written word because papyrus grew on the banks of the Nile. Mm -hmm. So the Ptolemies have basically a they control supply. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then there's this rival library that sets up. King Eumenes of Pergamum founds a rival library, the Library of Pergamum, um, and Pergamon was huge at the time. It was a big kingdom, like massive. Turkey. Modern day Turkey. And and more. You know, they were a big deal, the Perg Pergamites. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> basically, talk about sitcom potential. There's this spell in history. <laughs> where From the makers of Harriet Tubman! <laughs> exclamation mark. <laughs> There's this spell in history where both libraries are trying to uh, secure every book on the planet. And like they, they are bidding nice huge guess. wages for scholars, like Premier League footballers for, for scholars and scribes. Some scholars are in prison, so they can't run off to the other library. And then... The huge move happens. Ptolemy V takes the rivalry to a new level about 100 years after the founding. He bans the export of papyrus. Huge move. Ouch. That's yeah. cheating, oh, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Eat it, That's Pergamon. like taking the football off the pitch. It basically is. You can't make any <laughs> scrolls. You can't copy any manuscripts. We own literature. Huh. And So what did Pergamum do? Well, he... Invented paper? Yes, he must have invented paper. They the audiobook. He invented the audiobook. They started, <laughs> they started manufacturing parchment from the skin of animals. Oh. And parchment literally means from Pergamum. That's the etymology. Oh, no way. way. That's so cool. And the thing about parchment is you can cut it up in layers and you don't need to roll it in a scroll, yeah, which is yeah. incredibly inefficient. You can have pages. You can have pages. Huh. That's so and interesting. that is where, like, parchment already existed, but they as it were, put a lot of manufacturing behind it and made yeah. it bigger, you know. And the book is better than the scroll. 
Wow, the pen yeah. is mightier than the sword, and the yeah. book is better than the scroll. Do books. you know what, Andy? I'm going to come out and say it. That etymology is even more interesting than the horse genitalia. Wow. Well done. Wow. Yeah, Strong disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hi, everyone. We'd like to let you know that this week we are sponsored by Squarespace. Yep. Squarespace is an all-in-one website platform. If you are a budding entrepreneur or you're a budded entrepreneur and you just want to stand out, it'll make you a website or allow you to make your own website that's going to shine over and above every other website out there, including, you know, Google.com. That's how good it is. (laughs) (laughs) absolutely so if you're selling buds if you (laughs) as spring approaches if you have lots of buds budding in your lawn and you need to get those budding buds out of your lawn and into people's (laughs) houses then squarespace is the place to go they offer flexible payments if people buy stuff from you they have an ai which will help you to create any content on your website and they have a place where you can collect videos of all those budding buds budding (laughs) i think james is suggesting you might be setting up a horticultural website (laughs) but it's unclear they really are good and they have excellent search engine optimization tools so it's the place you need to go if you want to set up your own website and if you go to squarespace.com slash fish you'll get a free trial and when you're ready to launch you can save 10 percent of your first purchase of a website or domain that's right so go to squarespace.com forward slash fish and you will save of a website or domain using the code fish do it now buddy on with the podcast on with the show Okay, it's time for our final fact, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that bees smell like bananas when they get angry. Mm. I've never seen an angry banana. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this is this is just a weird coincidence, really. Um, bees use pheromones a lot to communicate. Um, like they release different chemicals which other bees can smell. One of the pheromones that they release is a distress or alarm signal. Maybe there's a predator, one of their bees is in trouble, makes them really angry too. Um, and one of the chemicals in this pheromone is called isoamyl acetate. And that also happens to be the chemical which is banana flavor yeah Mm. can i just say we mostly because i think people often say what you would know as banana flavor is actually this very specific banana thing most people know banana flavor from actual bananas right i mean i don't have that many banana flavored things have more people eaten bananas or eaten a banana flavored uh angel delight maybe or one of those little (laughs) i'm gonna go out there and say more people have eaten bananas (laughs) than banana flavored angels well that's because bananas have an entrenched advantage you know arguably (laughs) banana flavored angel delight is better than a banana if it grew on trees (laughs) (laughs) exactly yeah but you have hit the point that banana flavor uh, artificial banana flavoring today is not quite the same as the bananas we eat today yeah Um, Yeah. you have mentioned this on the podcast before and there's a there was a previous species of banana or, or stra- strain of banana called the growing shell banana which used to be all, all around the world it got nearly, I think it's still around in Thailand somewhere but it's not mm. commercially really available or used it was like nearly completely wiped out if not completely wiped out just so, by the angel delight market yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we eat Cavendish bananas now I think yeah, now. So, and, and they're supposed to be less tasteful um, and so actually mm. uh, the, the slightly tangier stronger artificial banana flavour in those tiny sweets that we get and that's that's the one that you get from the bees the bees yes and people it is a renowned thing in the bee community. I was messaging Liz, who is one of our colleagues who's been at QI longer than all of us, in fact. Um, and she's a beekeeper as well. And you mean she- Liz. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, she says, yes, sometimes you will enter the hive and there's a real banana stench. Is there really? And yeah. they also say, don't go near a hive with a banana. Um, is the other thing to what, do. Because it'll annoy them. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. they'll think it's a, they'll, they'll, it'll remind they'll them of the alarm. They'll think it's a large bee. Yeah, the other, especially if you paint black stripes on the banana. <laughs> I think it's the equivalent of walking into a hive with a big sign that just says, I killed your friends. Don't also go to a beehive with a pregnant mouse. <laughs> oh, that's where oh, I went wrong. Yeah. So pregnant mice smell like bananas. They do. Do they? Oh. Yeah, they do. It's um, a scent that they give off. And it also stresses out male mice. I saw amyl acetate. The smell of a pregnant female mouse. Yeah, it does. Stresses out males. Yeah, because That's mice it. are often um, cannibals and they will eat baby mice. Uh-oh. Uh-huh. Uh, but not if you make yourself smell like a banana 
the males will go, ugh, I'm not going near that, and they won't eat your children. <laughs> That's so ironic. <laughs> yeah. They won't eat you if you make yourself smell like a banana. What kind of a fucked up world is it? We'd be like, mm, delicious children. Oh, it's got banana on it. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't know the range of pheromones that bees use. There's so many. There's a massive list online. Yeah. There's extraordinary weird things that they can do. So, for example, the queen... There was a great article. She used to have bees, didn't she? <laughs> she smells of bananas. Queen Liz. Brilliant. Um, I d- found a piece on this from 2014. I just want to give a shout out to Luke Holman on the conversation. I don't know if you wrote the headline, but it was called Smells Like Queen Spirit. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so good. So nice. queen bees, they broadcast data via pheromones to the rest of the hive. And one of the things is to say they are the queen. That just communicates, you know, clear leadership in place. Another is whether or not they are mated and have been mating around, and also oh. how well mated they are. So they have pheromones to release to say how many males they've had sex with. <laughs> Imagine if our queen did that. It would be so funny. He's it's... opening a school and you're like, oh. <laughs> uh, more promiscuous queens are better for the colony because they provide a bit more genetic diversity mm. and that keeps the colony nice and healthy. Yeah. But also every, every queen has to... I was reading this interesting thing about how you introduce a queen to a colony. If you just take your queen and plonk it in, the bees will kill it because she's got the wrong pheromones. She's from another hive. Mm. Um, and the worker bees need a chance to get used to her. So the way that you do it is that you have a box and you put this box in the hive and the doorway to the box is sealed up with sugar, basically. The bees eat through it and it takes them a while, but it means that they end up being quite close to the queen who's sitting inside the little box waiting to be released from the box. And so the time it takes for the bees to eat Sorry. through the sugar, they can smell the queen on the other side and they get used to her and then they don't want to kill her. Oh. So it's like she bursts out of a cake. It's the <laughs> yeah, she of actually that. does, yes. She, <laughs> that is exactly how every new queen is introduced to a beehive. Um, another use of isoamyl acetate is to make fake bananas. And this happened during World War II. Let's say we've stopped any poo getting to Germany and they've said, right, well, you're not having any bananas then. Um, So you can't get any bananas there. So you have to make fake ones. And they made mock bananas by using parsnips. Uh, They would get some parsnips. They would add some isoamyl acetate, um, which was available banana essence, essentially, literally, essentially. And they would eat them. And apparently there was a modern day blogger called Carolyn Ekin uh, who recreated it and said it's a rather strange and bizarre taste, but not unpleasant, although there is a aftertaste of parsnip. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's so tragic. The, the yeah, idea of like, I mean, uh, that, that mash was, up your parsnips. That was the sugar. war. Mm, yeah. Bananas. Yeah, no, it really was. Um, when a queen bee dies, she stops releasing the pheromones that she's been using to keep the you know, colony happy and... Um, Placid, and this causes a big reaction, and the workers basically get going on an emergency queen. So mm. this is really interesting. They build these huge queen-sized chambers, like queen-sized bedrooms, effectively, um, and they get 10 to 20 candidates, workers, and they start feeding them royal jelly, mm. and they find out who becomes the queen. That sounds like a reality format. It yeah, actually is. Yeah. And the first one to emerge kills all the others, and then <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> begins to lay eggs. And that's... We make it past the ethics committee, the BBC, I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> There is only one pheromone uh, which two dung beetles share, okay? So most dung beetles have their own pheromones, mm-hmm. but there's one that's shared by both of them, and it's called anisole. <laughs> <laughs> Where do they release it from? <laughs> <laughs> it comes because it smells a bit like anise, like star anise. Oh, oh that is anisole. a name that works, I'm sure, brilliantly in the French market. <laughs> Isn't there a whole thing where beavers' anal glands are the origin of an awful lot of chemicals, Castorious. flavors, Castorious. including well, vanilla vin- and Durian. strawberry, yeah. raspberry flavoring? They're not necessarily used anymore because I think it's still quite rare and expensive, and also people don't really want that. On Only five percent of um, strawberry <laughs> anal glands actually <laughs> beaver <laughs> anal gland juice. Sadly, and if I went to a really nice restaurants, I did really get. Yeah, the renal glands don't worry. Did you? Oh, you're, in your angel delight. <laughs> <laughs> the anal <third>. delight. <laughs> um, can you guys smell ants? No. Uh, yeah, I want to. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, the ant detector's going off. Everyone, line up, pick up something much heavier than you, and file out of the building. <laughs> I'm not asking right now. Yeah. I'm saying in general, if uh, there was some ants on the table, do you think uh, you'd be able to smell them? I've never... No, I don't think I would. Yeah, so the interesting thing is that this is a thing that's 
people have said on the internet, a lot of people have said, oh, I can smell ants. And then other people have said, you can't smell ants. And then there's been big arguments. It's not like the internet to argue <laughs> over something completely pointless. Uh, but IFL Science, uh, which we all love, that website, they um, carried out a Twitter poll and they found that 20% of respondents claim that they can detect the odour of an ant compared to 80% really? who can't. Hmm. Ants are heavily dependent on pheromones. Were 20% of respondents ants? I <laughs> <laughs> don't know. Well, we don't know exactly. I think one thing we can say is that this is not a particularly scientific survey. Right. But let's say, for instance, it is true. There are various different reasons that it might be true. It could be that some people have a certain gene that allows them to smell ants, like you can smell asparagus wee. Some people can, some people mm, can't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It could be that some ants smell and the ones that live in certain areas smell, and the ones that live in certain areas don't smell. Yeah. And that's the responses we got, but we don't know. Or well, they're living in smelly areas, and we're smelling other things, and it's covering them up. Could if, I'm in, be. if I'm in like the, the ground floor of John Lewis, like I'm not going to smell an ant because it's the perfume section. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So if all of the UK smelly ants live in perfume sections of John mm. Lewis, yeah. we would never smell them. It's a very relatable uh, comparison point. It's, it's just something, it's a bugbear of mine. How often because you, yeah. I like going to John Lewis, I nearly pass out every time I go in. You have to sort of. Oh, I love walking. Like, I, I love walking past the perfume it. section yeah. in the department store. No. Yeah, I too. really like, I like it. it. Yeah. I really like going in an airport and trying out all the samples. Yeah, me and too. Then, Do you? Yeah, yeah. And then getting on the plane and really <laughs> offending everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've never tried that. I should do it. You should as do you it, honestly. The duty free, as you go through that wine. As bit. you go through the duty three, there's loads of free samples. Mm, that's another bit I hate because it smells so awful, as in so strong, and it like gives yeah. me headaches. So you've probably me... got quite a sensitive set of pipes yeah. on you. There's definitely an ant in this room. Right. <laughs> <laughs> quite a lot of hotels have got cameras in their bedrooms these days. In the beds, in fact. What? What? Where's this? Going? What? B hotel. What? Do you no, mean B hotels? Human hotels. Oh, human okay. hotels. Um, so this is something called the Spotter Gadget. It's got loads of pheromones in it and a tiny camera and you put it in a hotel bed and the pheromones attract bed bugs. And then when the bed bugs go into where the pheromones are, the tiny camera takes a photo of the bed bugs and sends it off to someone who looks at it and goes, yes, that's a bed bug. Because poor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then if they say, yes, it's definitely a bed bug, then it means that you have to go in and fumigate it. Is exterminated in. Yeah, yeah. Wow. But so, so these are in hotel rooms. Yeah. But can the camera capture anything else that's happening in the hotel room? If your penis is the size of a bed bug. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Then perhaps. <laughs> it was just drawn to that little tube. I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> okay, that's it. That's all of our facts. Um, thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in touch with us, we are all available on social media. I'm on Instagram at Alex H. Bell. James? I'm on Twitter at James Harkin. Andy? Uh, me too at Andrew Hunter M. And Anna? You can get in touch with the podcast by twittering at no such thing or on Instagram at no such thing as a fish or you can email podcast at qi.com. That's right. Uh, and you can also subscribe to Club Fish if you'd like to get the ad free version and you can buy merchandise from our website and all no sorts such of things No such thing as a fish.com. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back again next week. Goodbye. <laughs>